Hello everyone and welcome back for another edition of The Money Pros. I'm Oliver Tutt, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner, and I'll be your host for the next half hour as we talk about all the issues related to your money, how to make it, how to keep it, and hopefully how to help it grow. Let me tell you what we've got in store for today's show. First up, we're going to be talking about younger generations and whether or not they're less optimistic about their personal finances. Uh, some evidence suggests that they just very well may be and we're going to talk about some of the reasons and it's uh, something to be concerned about I think. Uh, we're going to be joined by our real estate pro Chad Kritzis with Keller Williams Realty. We're going to be talking about what I see is actually a related topic to the first segment and that's what first-time home buyers need to do in a particularly hot real estate market that we're in right now. Uh, and this is one of the things affecting uh, the financial attitudes of uh, younger generations. So we want to talk to Chad about that. Uh, in our third segment, how might you be impacted by a looming trade war? I don't know if you've been watching the news at all, uh, but we could be uh, battling it out with uh, some other nations, including China, with respect to our trade. And it's important to understand as a consumer, as somebody who works in the workforce, and certainly as an investor, how you may be impacted by that. So we're going to talk about that. And finally, we're going to get to a question uh, that we weren't able to get to on uh, last week's show about uh, whether or not someone should buy uh, stock in the company they work for. So we're going to talk about all of that, uh, and let's jump right into it. So interesting article uh, that I was reading uh, recently talking about um, consumer sentiment. So um, let me preface this segment by saying that optimism about your financial future is a prerequisite to good financial planning. Financial planning is all about thinking about the future. Uh, it is the antithesis of doing things now. You could spend all your money now in the thought that you're not going to have it in the future, in which case you don't need to do any financial planning, and I would suggest you uh, tune to another channel. Uh, but if you are concerned about the future, that's where financial planning kicks in because it's about planning for the future. But if you don't have some fundamental optimism about your future, you're going to be a lot less likely to plan. And there's some evidence that younger generations are less optimistic about their finances than they've been in the past. Um, uh, there was some research done uh, by University of Michigan in conjunction with Deutsche Bank, large investment bank, and their research indicated that Americans under 35 have uh, lower consumer confidence than those that are 55 or over. Now, this is notable because consumer confidence is a uh, economic measure uh, that we look at for the health of the economy and high consumer confidence uh, generally uh, drives the economy forward because about 75 percent of our economy is driven by consumers. The more optimistic they are, the more likely to, uh, they are to spend and invest in things like that. So what's interesting is consumer confidence is at its highest point right now since 2004, long before the financial crisis we saw in 2008. But what's different is that financial confidence uh, for those 35 and younger for the first time in six decades is actually lower than those 55 and older. So it's definitely an alarming trend because we think as parents we want our children to do better than we did. Uh, our parents wanted us to do better than they did. Uh, it's kind of a uh, generational uh, thought that we all have. Uh, and usually, uh, young people have been the most optimistic when we break out the generations, but this data indicates that they're not. What are some of the reasons for this? I want to talk about it, so let's throw up a slide and we'll talk about each one of them. Um, so the first one is increasing student loan debt. Now this is a topic we visited on the Money Pros on multiple occasions, and the reality is that student loan debt is at an all-time high. The figure stands at $1.4 trillion, and generations going to college now or just out of college in the past 10 years have student loan burdens that prior generations never had and many of them feel like it might be something they never get out of. What's another reason? Uh, rising home prices. And this is what we're going to be talking to our real estate pro about, right? Uh, particularly if you're a first time home buyer, real estate markets across the country are hot. They're, here, they're hot here locally, they're hot around the country, and it's making it more and more challenging for younger buyers to buy into the market. So we're going to talk to Chad about some things that first-time home buyers can do to make it a little easier. But 
many younger, uh, many people in the younger generation feel like they don't even have a chance to buy into the real estate market. And if they don't feel like they can, they're not going to try. And the final one that I think is worth talking about is political disenfranchisement. You have to consider the political environment over the past several years. Now, I'm not just talking about recent administration, but past administrations. The reality is that older generations have more control over the political climate in a lot of different scenarios. They tend to be more engaged, although younger generations are proving to be more engaged as of late with a variety of issues. But with things like tax cuts that are uh, directed primarily toward older, higher income earning people, uh, things like uh, less support for uh, college education, student loan deductions, things along those lines. Uh, so there are a variety of things that are uh, triggering people, and let's not forget a exploding uh, federal budget deficit that younger generations feel like they will be saddled with having to pay back. All of these things combine for increased pessimism for younger generations. So something to pay attention to, definitely something to be concerned. All right, up next we're going to be talking to Chad about what those first-time home buyers can do to make things a little easier. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Money Pros, joined now by our real estate pro, Chad Kritzis with Keller Williams Realty. So big lead in, right, because there's definitely a crisis of confidence, I think, uh, with younger generations uh, and their finances, and a big part of that is the housing market. Mm -hmm. So before we uh, jump into, you know, some ways to address some of that, maybe to alleviate some of that concern, uh, talk to us about where the market is right sure. now. Uh, I said it was hot. Back me it up on hot. this. It's definitely hot. We, we have this conversation in the last few episodes sure. over and over. And, you know, it's hard because we, we don't know where the viewers are sitting when they're watching the show. So we really try and break it down from a statewide level. Um, you know, and each market is really, it's individual, mm -hmm. it, no matter where you live. So, you know, statewide, single-family home sales are up 4.5% and prices are up 8%. The alarming thing, and I think this is a lot of what you're coming into, is the inventory of single-family homes, meaning the number of homes for sale. So when you're driving down the street, the number of signs you see is down 15% from this time over last year. So you have less homes, you have more sales, and automatically it's just going to start driving up prices. So that's where you're seeing the, the first-time home buyer segment, and especially what you're talking about in the previous segment, is it's very difficult to buy into that. I mean, you take the condos, you know, they're up 5%. Prices are kind of sitting around pretty pretty steady. And then multifamilies, you get a huge price increase of 27%. Um, and we're seeing that all over the place. The multifamily markets are insane right now. So um, i got so many questions that go along with this, but one of them is, uh, given the demand, is there much new construction going on? Well, there is. You know, we live in a very small state in Mattering. Like my offices really are in Bristol, North Kingstown, and Newport. And we just don't have that much land overall. So the guys that are building on spec, the ones that I work with or the ones I see in my markets, are doing well. Mm -hmm. um, the houses are selling. You know, obviously everything comes down to price again. Sure. You know, is a six hundred thousand dollars spec house going to sell as fast as a three hundred thousand dollars ranch today? You know, probably not as fast. Uh, but we're definitely. I don't feel like, and maybe your stats are different. There's not as much construction. Uh, people that are selling land are looking for a higher value, and your spec builders, you know, they can only pay X amount of, of dollars for the dirt. Right, because you, you have to put something up on in the, you know, 200 or 225 a square foot. You're, the, really, the land has to be purchased at the right cost, and that's I think that's where the challenge is: is finding land at the right price right now. So the new construction is is certainly not, we're just not able to fill the gap, and it also seems like a lot of the new construction is not in the first time oh, uh, home buyer not. category. So no, it's much more they're expensive. looking to maximize their. Uh, return on construction, right? And there's mm -hmm. probably a better payback with more expensive homes. So it's an even more of a challenge for uh, first-time home buyers. Um, I'm curious, before we get into like some of the things that people can do, just your experience in talking to buyers, because I remember pretty clearly when I when I went to buy my first home, and it was you know 20 plus years ago, um, but being frustrated that I couldn't afford a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And my real estate agent said, you know, that's normal. Like almost every price point, the person that you're dealing with wishes they could afford a little of bit course. more to sort of right. get used to that. But do you, ins do you sense an increasing sense of frustration that, you know, somebody, you know, husband and wife, they have good jobs, they did all the right things, and they're not able to sort of realize the dream they had of real estate? Is that getting worse, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, we just said 15% down in inventory, right? There's, there's less homes to choose from. You have all these qualified buyers, like you said, they're, they've been planning, they're sick of renting. You know, and I had a conversation last night with somebody, he said, well, I've been renting since I was 18. He said, I would have paid off half a house by now. Mm -hmm. So you're getting multiple offers, over asking, 
we're seeing a lot of, we use what's called an escalation clause a lot now. It's kind of an addendum to, to an agreement. It says, well, I'll beat any other offer you have up, you know, by, say, $1,000. Really? Up to whatever the ceiling is. To encourage somebody to come back if they have a counter offer that's better mm -hmm. than the one you're submitting. Or if there's, a, you know, an offer they're ready to take. We're saying, well, we'll beat whatever offer you have by 1500 or whatever the number is. Wow. You know, you got to be more aggressive in this market. You have to be prepared in this market. But really, it's, you know, that, that lower price point, we say the lower price point, but that first-time home buyer price point is very competitive. And you're right, because the newer construction tends to be more in the, at least in my markets, in the five, six, six fifty range. Mm -hmm. That typically isn't your first-time home buyer buying right. a half a million or a six hundred thousand dollar house. It's kind of the uh, joke when you watch some of the like the house hunters things yeah. on TV. You know, uh, I love uh, those. I'm a I'm a professional dog walker, and my wife makes macrame, and our budget is one point two million dollars. <laughs> yeah. And you look at these, you're like, York how City. can this be <laughs> your thing? You know. So let's talk about some things people can do in your estimation. What are the most important steps that uh, first-time home buyers can take to give themselves the best shot at getting something that's right for them and something they can afford? Oh, well, first things first, you have to get pre-approved. And we were talking about this earlier. Really, you need to be approved by somebody very reputable, hopefully. And it doesn't, I don't necessarily need to know them, but a lot of times you'll see these internet, I won't use any companies, you'll see these internet company pre-approvals. And they'll have this, you know, they're very easy to get. They're, mm -hmm. they're simple to fill out a form. And they'll get this escalated number where they're approved to. Well, all of a sudden you get, you know, two weeks before closing or three weeks before closing and they get, a, they get a denial letter, right? Because this company doesn't really do the due diligence that your local educated, you know, person or person mortgage broker, like your financial planner, I'd rather sit with you than give my money to somebody online. Sure. So you, you really want a, you know, a professional with a good pre-approval. You, know, you want to know your numbers ahead of time. You don't want to be house poor, right? You don't want to get into a house and not be able to go out to dinner because you're going to pay your mortgage. So this was something that our mortgage pro, uh, Steve Tetzner, talked about yeah. on last week's show, which that. was the importance of uh, not using these online uh, mm -hmm. mortgage companies where you can tell them anything you want and they'll spit out a pre-approval. Right. But, uh, you know, it's a little more rigorous process if you go to somebody locally, they're actually going to vet your finances. And you're saying that plays a role in uh, your ability to, to get your offer accepted when you make one on the house that you decide is right for you. Absolutely. So I, on my team, I predominantly do listings. That's my job. I sell, I market, I negotiate for the listings and the sellers. So if I have a pre-approval letter and, I, you know, it's a questionable, I just say, online company, and there's somebody else that you're fighting against that's got a, you know, either a cash off or somebody you may know or somebody more reputable. I mean, you're going to take all of those things in, in consideration when you're negotiating. So you're going to advise your seller potentially, look, this, this person's clearly got a pre-approval from a company that I know that's local versus this one's from XYZ online. Right. You know, that's going to uh, tip the balance there. in their favor. Like we had one this morning that was cash, right? So you get cash <laughs> versus an online letter. There's not a chance that sure. we're, you know, we're going with the But cash. not usually an option that a lot of first-time home buyers are going to have unless they're right. you know, professional dog walkers. Like the issue that you got to watch out for, sometimes it, you know, when we really have to sell the house twice. We've got to sell it once to the buyer, but we got to make sure the bank appraiser is going gonna, is gonna to say that you know, the, the value is right. right. So if you're, you get into this crazy market where the prices are over-escalating, you know, the appraisers are going to start coming in short. So that, you know, that really plays a factor in the percentage of financing. So if you're doing like 0% down or 3% down financing, and the numbers are really tight in the appraisal, that, you know, that could also go wrong. And so the appraisals, we talked about this before, don't always keep pace with the current state of the market when the market's right. running up uh, really quickly. Are you seeing more interest in um, uh, fixer-uppers, maybe because it's more affordable, at least initially, or you know the prevalence of television shows that talk about <laughs> fixer-uppers and things like that. Are you seeing people more willing to, to do that, or has that kind of stayed consistent? Well, the fixer-uppers, you have to look at it two ways, right? So you have your first-time home buyer who wants to buy that fixer-upper and, and do some sweat equity, which isn't really the, the big portion of the market. Most people want to you know, turn the key, put the clothes in, and not do a ton of work. Okay. The issue you have. And you with find the, particularly with first-time home buyers that do. they really want the turnkey property. Like I, I don't know about yourself. I'm not a handy guy, so buying. I'm a, extremely handy, just so we're clear. About okay. Go ahead. Good, good to know. <laughs> Come on over. <laughs> yeah. So if you got to know, I mean, if somebody doesn't have the skill set to do it, you then have to pay a premium to get a contractor over to do it. Now the real estate market affects every other market. So if we're busy, the contractors are busy, the electricians busy, they're, everybody's busy. The other issue you're doing is you're fighting with the the flippers. Right, as you get a low end, a lower end home that can use some renovation and still sell very quickly at a hundred or hundred fifty thousand dollars more to a first time home buyer, 
you know, you, the sharks are swarming. They, you know, there might be five, 10, 15 offers on that property. So it's not the old, you know, that house has been sitting on the market for a year because it's really run down. If it's priced right, somebody's going to want to jump on it and they're yeah. willing to do the work. And the flippers have the advantage of the networks of contractors and things like that. And that the cash. I know as a, I, I said I was handy, but as a first time home buyer, I wasn't. And it's intimidating to think about having to hire plumbers and electricians and mm -hmm. things like that. But it may be the entree into that first property that you couldn't otherwise afford if you can fire, uh, if you can find the right place. My first property was a multifamily. You talked about uh, multifamily <coughs> prices uh, skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. uh, are first time home buyers displaying some interest in multifamilies to get all the numbers to work. I mean, that's what happened with me. The numbers worked because I could use the rent from two units to right. pay for mine. I wouldn't have been able to afford that house otherwise. Is that a trend that's increasing or is that staying the same? It's increasing in some markets. Some markets are very difficult, like Newport, for instance. The multifamily prices have, have skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. I mean, a two, th three family home selling for five, to a three family on Annandale Road in Newport just sold for 785. You know, so even if you take those other two rents and put it on top of what you're making, it's still hard to make those numbers work. You know, a lot of these investors are just buying up Newport at these very high prices right now. Uh, and I guess the last question I have is, given how hot the market is, should people consider selling into it? If, the, if you were ever going to, I've been doing this 20 years now, if you ever thought about selling your home, this is the best market I've ever seen to sell real estate. But what if you got to buy something else? That becomes a question. So are you downsizing <laughs> or you, you know, going somewhere else. That's the challenge I have, right? Yeah. I've thought about selling, but then where would I go? Where would I go? <laughs> uh, Chad, thanks for the information, as always. Extremely valuable. Uh, all right, up next, we're going to be talking about who's impacted by a trade war. Stay with us. There's more to come. Welcome back to The Money Pros. Now we want to talk about uh, how you might be impacted with a looming trade war. So uh, let me talk about what's going on. Um, I'm sure all of you are following the news. Uh, President Trump and his administration uh, have uh, begun to impose tariffs in a variety of different industries uh, for a variety of different reasons uh, in an effort to, in their minds, address inequities in our trade imbalances with a variety of different countries. So not going to stray into the politics of it, but we need to talk about the economics of it because every American is going to be affected, some positively, some negatively, uh, and you should be aware of how this would come into play. So. Uh, in the past couple of months, the Trump administration has announced 25% tariffs on steel and aluminum. Now, uh, that means that imported steel and aluminum would be 25% more expensive. A tariff is nothing more than an added tax, and that would make imported metals uh, more expensive. I have a friend uh, who owns a manufacturing company, and they manufacture screws and other fasteners, and he is particularly worried about this because that could make his raw materials prices go up. Uh, now, this isn't an effort to protect, protect the steel and aluminum industries, but protect means for those industries to have the ability to charge higher prices. So whether you're using Chinese steel or you're using U.S. steel, the likelihood is uh, those uh, commodities are going to become more expensive. In retaliation, China announced tariffs of, on $3 billion worth of U.S. exports to China that include primarily food products like soybeans and pork. Uh, so there are repercussions for that, but that means that exported goods from the United States will become more expensive in China. Uh, the White House responded to those tariffs from China uh, with an additional $50 billion in suggested tariffs on 1,300 different Chinese products that include uh, consumer electronics. So your uh, iPhones and Androids and all those other things uh, could potentially become more expensive. So let's talk about the categories of people uh, that could be affected. Uh, first up, consumers are absolutely going to be affected. Now, it can work in a couple of ways. Food products uh, that are affected by tariffs, Chinese tariffs, uh, could become less expensive because we could see gluts uh, in markets like soybeans and pork, bacon, things like that, that get exported if uh, there's less exports happening uh, and the farmers are less likely to be able to sell those products, we could see gluts in those products. Those products could become cheaper. On the flip side, things like consumer electronics could become quite a bit more expensive. People are already talking about the Christmas shopping season and some of those goods becoming quite a bit more expensive. And certainly things that use raw materials that include steel and aluminum could be more expensive think cars in the auto industry. All right, up next, let's talk about investors. 
Investors in companies that are protected by U.S. tariffs are probably going to do pretty well. So companies like steel and aluminum uh, manufacturers would benefit, and that's who these tariffs are designed to benefit. But companies that use those products, like car manufacturers, airline manufacturers, could certainly be affected by uh, those tariffs. And companies like Apple that import could also be affected. Last one, labor. Listen, I don't have to elaborate on this, but if you're working for a company that's going to benefit by the tariffs, like steel and aluminum, you could be in good shape. But if you're working for a company uh, that, like the auto industry, where their prices are going to rise and sales could potentially decline, that could adversely affect you. The problem is there's really no winners in a, uh, in a trade war. And what we're seeing in the stock market is significantly increased volatility. And the number one reason is uh, the looming threat of tariffs. So you're going to have to pay very close attention to it. The last chapter in this story absolutely is not written. All right, when we come back, we're going to answer a question on owning stock in your company you work for. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Money Pros. I have a viewer question that we didn't have a chance to get to on last week's show, so I want to get to it now. And the viewer wrote in and asked, my company has offered me a program where I can buy their stock at a 15% discount as long as I hold it for five years. The purchase would come out of my paycheck. Is that a good idea? So this is a very common program offered by employers that have publicly traded stock. It's called an Employee Stock Purchase Plan, or ESPP. And uh, I see a lot of offers for these. I am generally not a fan. The 15% discount is a great thing. So when you buy the stock, you're immediately uh, ahead by 15%. But the problem is most plans now require that you hang on to the stock for a minimum amount of time. There used to be a time where you could buy the stock at a 15% discount, turn around and sell it. And that's an arbitrage opportunity, we call that in finance. You could make money right away on that deal. But the companies have wised up to that, and they've decided that you need to hang on to it for a min minimum period of time. So that 15% discount could get wiped out. The stock price could go up, and it could get magnified. Anybody knows. But the issue is that I always am reticent to recommend that people buy stock in the company they work for. You already have a significant financial investment by being an employee. Doubling down by owning stock can be a shaky investment. And of course, it depends on the company. All right, that's the best I could do with the short amount of time we had. Thanks for watching The Money Pros. We look forward to seeing you again right here next weekend. Have a great Sunday, folks. Take care.